my friends. I'm Brent Adams. Welcome to <laughs> Wait, your second episode of Outlaws to the End. And following, I mean, like we said, we were going to stop doing a weekly podcast, and yet here we are doing a weekly podcast again. Lauren, what's wrong with us? The list is far too long. As someone, as, so as this will be evident you, soon when you meet the other people on the show. As someone so succinctly observed on the website recently, you guys suck at retiring. <laughs> um, you, you have commitment issues, I would, I would say, is what the problem is. Those aren't the only issues we have. We also have <laughs> issues named Tony Grice and Daniel Kaiser, who are joining us Wait, for today's hello. episode. I'm confused. W- was that the intro? Because I'm not used to that kind of type of intro from Brent <laughs> Adams. <laughs> that was, that that was, that was Brent. Brent has not really figured out an intro for the new <laughs> format. I really haven't. I really, I really don't have. Is your have. daughter sleeping? No. My testosterone might be, but... <laughs> Um, we're, we're just we're, we're we're slightly less badass than we ever were, <laughs> or Brent is anyway. They're going, they're going for a more well, mainstream audience. They're trying to. That's right. Down. Hello, ladies. we're going to add multiplayer to the show soon. Welcome to the weekly yeah. gaming. Uh, the display. intro music is like it's all mellow. It's like this cool, like uh, haunting spaghetti western kind of uh, <laughs> kind of melody now, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense to come into that with the. I thought like, know, like Travis like, Smiley was going to start talking for a second. There. The, the, the death, but not on this show. Where you, you know, kidding? maybe actually, Brent, maybe we do need someone else to intro the show. Maybe we can get the guy who voiced Marston uh, to come in and maybe do the intro for us. We should be so lucky. Out. We should be so lucky. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's the only thing he's ever done. Uh, I think you're right. Well, I, there was there was a write up on him on I don't know Polygon yeah, or, or something really a long time ago. It was kind of interesting about how he, you know, like basically he, he like did the job and then he kind of walked away from what could have been a promising career to just focus on his family and all that. And everybody was like, sucker. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the reason that, uh, that the four of us are, and actually l- l- let's go through Tony. How are, how are you, Tony? <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm doing well, Brent. Pleasant how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's nice to be with you on this, this, uh, nice evening. Um, I'm just eating a bit of pie and I'm glad to join <laughs> here today. <laughs> Should be a very nice and pleasant evening with four nice friends together sitting by the fireplace. <laughs> is that is that the way the show is going now? Is, it is, is, it's is a that, much more mature. mature podcast. I, I get a, I get a very different vibe now. I uh, yes, I mean I indeed. like it. It's 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 calming. It's very calming. Hmm. Daniel, how That's are you doing? Set. Sa- save Tony from this pit he's dug himself into. Well, my fine chap, I'm doing Jesus. wonderful. And Jesus. I'm so proud of this episode brought to you by AARP that we have the opportunity <laughs> to be here. <laughs> uh, no, I'm doing great, man. It's good to what talk with you guys dick. as always. Well, it's been too long, but um, we have some good things to talk about. It's a very poignant time for me, a poignant time in the industry as well, as uh, yeah. lots of shifting, ebbing, flowing, but... Um, but uh, mostly I'm game trailers whole... getting fucking clobbered. Mostly game trailers dying is what yeah. we're here to talk about. Um, yeah, we will talk about that. But um, uh, for those who don't know that are listening, I've I you know I'm I'm at Epic Games now, and uh, everybody uh, so, everybody knows. Well, because we we've been screaming you know from the mountain tops you know for you like could three save weeks. percent on car insurance. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're, uh, you're not supposed to come on the show and indicate to the listeners that you don't actually listen to the show. We spent about half an hour every episode for four months. Yeah, bullshit. Talking about people. you. I'm kidding. Well, but, you know, new people might listen to this show. No, we're talking about how game trailers is gone, right? Listen, There's no more I'm new sure people. If, if this is this is the number one podcast, I don't know this for sure, but I saw the data. This is the number one podcast in nursing homes across America. <laughs> that is, that is, that is you probably you guys, you guys are being a little bit too loud, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, trying to get this train back on the tracks. Too late. <laughs> um, you know, we uh, obviously we saw the news recently. The game trailers has closed their doors. I guess was it Monday this week that it happened? I can't I can't remember the exact day, but it seemed like I, th- right. I think it was uh, I think it was tu- I think it was Tuesday it, also. It was, Maybe it was Tuesday, Tuesday. Uh, it was either Tuesday or Monday. Yeah. So anyway, the point Might is, early no, no, it was week, it was Monday. It was Monday. Early this week, you know, the the, the news went out. The game trailers was closed. I think, and that, and that everybody there was let go, and certainly. I, well, I'm sure there's plenty of people on plenty of websites and plenty of podcasts that, that mention this. It does hold a special significance for us because us being the four of us on this show and all of you who are listening, the reason that we're all here has to do with game trailers. 
And as 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 we're gonna as we're gonna talk about through the course of this episode, game shows is what brought these hosts and this audience together. And so it's it's kind of an important part of our story, the Epic Battle Axe story, now the Outlaw Gamer story, and then each of us individually. So I think the person who it, it's most logical to start with uh, in this conversation is me. So let me tell you what <laughs> now. <laughs> Daniel, uh, you wanna, obviously... You want to build up in importance as we go on. Obviously, if, if what I've just said is true and that game trailers, you know, is kind of the, the center spoke in all this, you're sort of the axle, you're sort of the... The, the center pin that held all this together and that brought all this together because you, you're the one that worked at game trailers and that uh, over time you know brought in people like Tony and myself and Lauren uh, you know into Epic Battle Axe and then the audience you know, kind of followed as we started doing shows. What did this announcement mean for you? Well, you know, I think um, first and foremost, thanks for that and thanks for having me on the show. I mean, it's um you're right. I mean, none of us would be here without GT. And I, I think that that's, that's just like, it, 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 it sounds almost too simple or, or almost too big, but the rea- yeah. it's like the reality of the situation. Now, uh, Tony and I were roommates prior to me being at GT. Um, and you know, when I, when I helped start GT in 2005, it was just a little thing with just a couple of guys. And I went out to LA to try to do it. So we were struggling to try to get something off the ground. So I was, you know, I was in Tennessee. I had been Tony's roommate. I knew you, Brent. I didn't know you, Lauren. Um, I just want really, to put in real quick that Tony's roommate is one of the things he put on his, yes. you know, <laughs> his, his resume. resume. That's right. uh, there was no is, resume. How do you, th- how do you I, think they got hired? Come I, on. I, I never applied for a job with Game Trailers. There was no job. It was like I met them through chance at and and you know I was you know doing the grind trying to just get my you're, name. You were writing for Yahoo Gaming at the time, were you? And you're, yeah, just, you're just trying to kind of meet up with somebody that was wanting to start something big and new. And well, actually, they contacted me and said, "Hey, uh, can you host some uh, like not host in front of the camera? They wanted me to ask questions off camera." for three days at E3 2005. That was my first interaction with GT. Prior to that, they were just this little up-and-coming site that had been getting traffic uh, and, and some traction based on the fact that they were showing videos at, a, at as high a quality as possible. Uh, Off-camera and being the key word. Yeah, for, for me, it was off camera, but they, they were showing trailers from video games, which there weren't a, a, you know, a ton, but they were showing everything that they could show, and it really just gained a lot of traction because it was the perfect storm coming up that year that that year you look at e3 2005 to e3 2006 we had next gen consoles in the ps3 and xbox 360 that people wanted to see video of we had increased bandwidth because prior to that tony when we were roommates i remember going to ign.com and Mm. downloading a video like i would want to watch a 30 second clip of a video and i would hit download and then go have a sandwich like oh yeah 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 you know, we would just hang out and play Gran Turismo in the in the living room or whatever while I was waiting for a video to download. Oh, and it was and and, and this was this was before you were really getting anything in high definition. You you were yep. maybe getting some four eighty, maybe. Yeah, yeah. If you were getting yeah. four eighty, that that was a high quality, you know, trailer or something. And you were sitting there forever, you know, waiting for it to to, to play. So this really was the perfect storm because th- people started getting better internet access and the the need was there and the consoles were there. So um, to help start game trailers was was an amazing thing for me personally. Like I said, ne- I didn't apply for a job. I just met with these guys. I landed back in Tennessee. I had a message on my phone saying they, they needed me. They wanted me to come out and work with them. And I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but let's do it. So, you know, that's how that story started. And ultimately, over the course of time, bringing you guys in, you know, with uh, starting Epic Battle Axe and bringing everybody on board. The bottom line, though, is literally GT has touched n- my life in a very... Like, I literally wouldn't be here today. Not just, like, on this call, but just, like, I wouldn't be at where I am in my career. I wouldn't have done... I don't know what I would have done, you know. I would have done something to fill the time, I guess. Probably a line of hair care products. Yeah, but I mean, maybe maybe (laughs) V-neck shirts. Um, I just got off of work, dude. (laughs) V-neck is a uniform there. Come on, man. I, I took my shirt off, and I'm wearing this. I didn't know we were video. <laughs> uh, but anyway, my point is that uh, you know it it 
there's no understating how big GT is in my personal life and how much it has impacted not just us, but you, you know, you think about, you know, Jess Condit, you think about Keith, you think about all the people that have come and, and gone and, and gone through what we've done, much less gone through GT. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, for me, it is a very deeply personal thing. So you opened by asking the question, how did I feel? I felt very reflective, very reflective, sad in a way. Um, I, I think we all knew this wasn't like out of the blue. Uh, I mean, it was out of the blue that it happened, like the, the way that it happened. But I think that the demise of game trailers, you uh, sort of knew it was coming, but you know, it's it going sort of, in that direction. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, they I laid mean, me basically off. ever since they laid off Daniel, it was going in that direction. Let's be honest. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> it, well, it switched hands and it went to a different company and you know, no one really knew what the intent of what was with that company. And I haven't been there since. You I'm, know, I'm still not sure anyone knows what the intent of that was <laughs> because it doesn't really seem like there was a lot of intent there. Right. I mean, don't we all kind of feel in general that they, they just wanted the name? In, yeah. the, in the same way that G4 wanted Tech TV, you know, when they bought that network, they wanted the name and the audience that came with it. And, you know, then they turned it into their own thing. And, I mean, it seems like that was kind of the plan here. It's just that it, it wasn't successful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and I at least for right. a while, G4 was. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, a, I, to be honest, we'll get to this, I'm sure, at some point, but there's a larger conversation here about game trailers and its, um, its uh, ability or inability to evolve and, and really kind of out of the hands of the creators. But um, the reality of the situation was that we're not just with talking about one company. We're talking about a gigantic shift in the way media is handled in our lives today yeah. gaming media is a subset of that which is profoundly impacted by that you know direction that everything has gone in um and game trailers um is a consequence um on the positive side at the beginning and on the negative side at the end uh literally peaks and valleys about what this 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 change has meant so uh, tony you know I'm just going to ask you this, you know, just as a way of kind of like starting this conversation. But I mean, ultimately, isn't YouTube what killed game trailers? Yeah, I mean, that's I was about to say that a second ago. It's just it's it's almost kind of the fact that game trailers was what it was when it was it, is is the only reason it kind of was able to do as much as it did for as long as it did. YouTube once it came in and got the market share and got you know just 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 grew enormously. You know, once after Google bought it and you know put put its muscle behind it, it just yeah. there was. Anything for any video content. I mean, you know, I, I would even argue, like, even now you are starting to see Twitch and some other, you know, things like that are, are you know, I, I, I wonder how they are going to hold up to, you know, to YouTube down the road. It's like YouTube is yeah. just this, you know, 800 million having, pound gorilla. Having that, Amazon behind them is about the only way Twitch could. They, exactly, exactly. But you yeah. just, you look at, like, what they were able to provide at that time, nobody else really was providing. And then once you, you have someone else providing it, and frankly... To some degree, I'd say it's it even opened. You know, YouTube is is more open. More people can I say more open. It was just it was open to people being able to make their own content and just making your own content at home and just uploading it straight has kind of made collected groups of content maybe slightly less workable in the future. Anyway, you know, yeah. like that was one thing that was or just great about ne- GT or just is less necessary. Less necessary. Yeah, GT had some some amazing original content. You know, the first thing that got you in there was watching. You know. Watching all the newest trailers there, that was the best place to go. Um, that, that was that was the place that always had the trailers first, and you know, then then you'd see this other content that would really add to it. That would give some contextualized, uh, you know, like breaking down different series and 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 looking at the retrospectives of different games and giving you, um, you know, th- things like you know when they brought on Screw Attack and brought new content in. Just that was all kinds of stuff that made it a really good reason to go there. Then once it became so easy to self produce that sort of content on your own, it became easier and easier for other people to do it. And frankly, just more and more competitive, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I, I think there's absolutely no question that, you know, YouTube is the reason that game trailers is not around anymore. I do kind of wonder that, you know, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say yes, but it, it's also, I mean, anyone who tracked the situation knows that at the time, you know, we were acquired by Viacom and Viacom had a decision to make, you know, um, Viacom chose to um, kind of you know, if remember the Napster days where it was like oh we don't think you know distributing our music digitally is going to be good for us um, so you know we want people to buy CDs of our stuff all the time 
there was a mentality. They call and, that and, Lars Ulrich syndrome. <laughs> yes, exactly. We covered this on an early episode of EBC, I think. Yeah, but just as a refresh, and, and to you're exactly right, TG, in that like YouTube is was a force, was a force to be reckoned with. I'll read you guys some stats about its current you know um, uh, user base in in a, in a little bit. But the reality of the situation is they were coming on and coming on strong, and they were pioneering in ways that were uh, democratizing video and the the corporate you know umbrella that we were under at Game Trailers um, decided that. Instead of embracing that, they were going to combat it. And what that did was put us into a three-year lawsuit at, at the point of inception where we had an opportunity and the traction to say, uh, we're going to make a deal with these guys and actually own a corner of that and, and, and do it that way. Instead, it was a battle. And during that battle, we weren't, uh, you know, GT wasn't allowed to do anything. Uh, on, with on, YouTube. They weren't allowed to do anything on YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. Which, which so, I, think, I think is really significant because, in oh, my yeah. opinion, had that gone a different way, I think even at the end, I think even at the end, they might have been able to turn it around. But, you know, Game Trailers as a website might have gone away, but they would be, like, the biggest YouTube channel for gaming. Right, you know, which you know, doesn't matter. Like, like right, that. right now, as you look at the landscape, it, it isn't about, like, a destination. It's about a brand that could, you know, yeah. penetrate through these other sectors, but... Anyway, and sometimes it is hard to see that, like you know, I because I your apps like hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you see that and say like, yeah, that you know they should have never they should have totally embraced that, but like at the time, and I mean, not by no means making excuses, you know, for for all decisions, but like you do sort of you do sort of wonder sometimes those kind of calls are like, you know, well, if we if we push and fight this, maybe you know, maybe it works out better for us in the end, you know, and it, it, but it's a it's a pretty big roll of the dice that obviously you know. Yeah. did not play out so well. Daniel, I'm curious, you know, I'm curious as somebody who wasn't part of, uh, part of the back end of when that stuff was going on and, and the relationship with YouTube. And uh, again, like you said, obviously YouTube is, is an enormous force, but at the end of the day, to quote uh, a good friend of mine, uh. Uh, I think that uh, ultimately <laughs> content is king. And I think, I feel like when, when YouTube started taking the market segment that they did, GT probably had, as you said, had to rethink sort of what they were doing. And it seemed to me that particularly after you left, and I'm not alluding to the fact that it's because you left, but I'm also not saying that it's not because you had a significant editorial impact on that, uh, on what GT was producing. Um, but it feels to me like GT didn't respond with the, with the uh, content plan that, was, that, that, that um, rang true with the viewership that might have been able to combat YouTube, whether or not they had the YouTube channel. Uh, to you know that that is an outlet, but that the content that was being produced, uh, it, it doesn't feel like the corporate machine was able to turn the ship fast enough and and make the changes and produce the content that ne- they needed that rang true the way that Let's Plays are ringing true on YouTube. I'm curious to get your take on that because obviously you were you know the the that stuff was going on before you left and then took a big turn sort of at that time after you left. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And this is the really interesting part. We're not just talking about the distribution method of video. We're not just talking about the uh, consumption of video. We're talking about the actual type of content that is being distributed. And we're coming from the standpoint of being a, a production. Like everything that we did was intended to be of the highest quality um, to make sure that, you know, we were like TV for video games, right? But then YouTube doesn't just come along and dis- disrupt the distribution model. It also disrupts the, it disrupts the, the perceived value of that, of, of production. You know, lo-fi stuff has become the new hi-fi, right? It's just like everybody used to strive for utmost stuff, and now it's like pick and choose. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you see, because of YouTube, you, you have to understand, you were talking about a service here, okay, that has 300 hours of content uploaded every minute, okay, according to their stats. They also say that 95% of all their audience um, who, who play games globally, 95% of gamers globally use YouTube in some way to engage with games, either uploading or viewing content. They have 1 billion unique visitors every month now, and 20% of that is basically gaming stuff. Um, they're gigantic, and the quality of the content doesn't always matter. This is the big thing. We were trying to put together productions. I kind of liken it to, 
being in school and you're, you know, you, you love theater and you want to put on the drama, you're on the drama side, you want to put on like the end of the year production or even just like the seasonal production and you're, you're, you, for you, the love and the passion of that is is writing the scripts it's working on the sets it's organizing everything and then you put on the production there's all the effort and energy that goes into a moment you you share that moment with people and and then there is there is that and that's great and then there's like the class clown who just kind of like hey i'm funny like right now in the moment in the classroom where you are at the time and it's just real and it's just raw and sometimes they're funny and sometimes they're not and but you just kind of like to hang around with that person because they're there and you, that's it so youtube spawned a whole generation of class clowns basically not to say that they're i mean honestly i'll be honest i mean like i look at the talent level of like a host like amanda mckay who's like a fantastic host you could throw her on a stage with like you know any actor or actress and she can knock it out of the park on live tv she's amazing you take a lot of the youtube people and i still don't i'm not knocking it i'm just saying it's a totally different beast and that's what became popular people were like well there's so much work involved in in the really high produced stuff i just want to like you know do whatever on camera well, and uh, it, I, I I definitely agree with that. Although I, the thing with YouTube is, and I, I have to kind of give them some amount of credit, is the the not only just like what content is covered, you know, because that that is as expansive as can be. I mean, literally, yeah. you can view anything. You 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 are into a certain you know small independent company that's only put out three games in twenty years. You know that no one's ever heard of. There's eighteen you know people putting out videos. You know. Uh, about that, you know, it's it, you can watch anything you want, but also the the quality level. Uh, it, at first, I, I, I think it was diverse. well, and I was going to say, yeah, you have some things that are every bit as highly produced as some of the best stuff out there, and some that is just you know a guy holding up his low quality camera, you know, to you. It's just the thing, mm. the thing like that. I really did from it, game trailers perspective, like yeah. from, from from the content we were doing, which was we're going to get information about games to you. Like we're going to talk about games, you know. It didn't need to be highly produced anymore. Right. It just that, needed that was, to be. That was kind of the wrong approach. It, it was sort of the right. wrong approach for that time. Well, but I feel like also when it when it uh, and I, so I kind of trailed off watching after you left, and it kind of uh, it went in a very different direction. Um, but I think there's also there's also <clears throat> excuse me uh, in, in, in between there, and I think sort of the time after you left, they really went for that sort of lower fi kind of look to it. And I think there's an in between, and I kind of think of it like the stylized messy hair, right? And I think it, you know it's meant to be relatable and look messy, but it's it's really kind of stylized. But you you don't quite perceive that it's that it's stylized in that way. And I actually, I, as I was kind of thinking of that analogy, I, I think about Epic Battle Cry, the podcast, um, and the video cast of it. And it's it is uh, in my mind something that's very relatable. It didn't it doesn't take. I mean, I know you guys spent maybe fifteen minutes doing the show every week, even though somehow <laughs> it ended up being thirty. I don't know. And in uh, fairness, in fairness, Brent we, spent we, we like twenty. Fast. I think <laughs> <laughs> we it was, fast. I slowed it down. Um, yeah. But the, here's a show that's that is uh, made almost like you know a YouTube channel. You know, you guys are. You're, I know. I, I know how the sausage gets made with that one, but it still has that polished feeling to it, right? And it's somewhere in between. And and I think that. Um, Again, after uh, at the point after you left, um, certainly uh, they weren't able to capture. They're, they're losing to what you said, which is that sort of popularized uh, class clown. And I think there might have been a, a better way to capture that um, w without without uh, succumbing to uh, a modicum of professionalism or, or values or quality. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, again, I don't know. Um, well, it's just, you know, I, I think that model, though, that model of um, the, the game journalism, journalism space is just a totally different place, you know, the, the, because there was a point that we, we were needed when game trailers came on board. We were needed because these other platforms didn't exist. So when companies wanted to get their message out, they, they leaned on the press to reach their audience. Yeah. But now they have, it's almost like our, they, so now archaic they do it to think themselves. about. They just yeah, have yeah. their own audience, right. you know, and got YouTube, again, they got can speak Twitter directly and... to them and they have people that want to speak for them. So they, you know, they just, yeah. they put that content out. I, let me ask you, like one thing I, I sort of felt like is it seemed like, you know, the kind of, I don't know if it was the in like absolute intent, but they got rid of all of their, I shouldn't say all, but they got rid of a lot of their talent. Like a lot of the people that really were what they were in front of the camera and, 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 and recording and like did they think that 
that it was like, well, we've, we've got our audience and we know what content they want. You know, we don't want to get bogged down by having to work with, you know, these people we're going to have to pay X amount of money. We, we can do it with somebody else or something like that. Like what, what was the idea? Cause to me, that seems like that's where a lot of the personality, like that's the whole thing about YouTube. Like for whatever you want to say, like somebody like a PewDiePie who's worth umpteen billion dollars, like, you know, I, I don't get it, but his fans absolutely get it. And I think that's the thing is a lot of people would watch specifically because they liked how you would speak, how you would talk to them, how you would communicate yeah. things across. They liked uh, Amanda McKay. They felt that she was professional and that she would speak in a way that they, they liked. It was it was fun yet serious. Like, you know, you could have fun, but yet it was, it was res- respectful of the medium, which I don't think a lot of times you do always get. I think you almost get this kind of like talking – almost like a little bit talking down to your audience to some degree, like we're elitists talking about stuff and you're just taking what we give you as opposed to an actual journalist. And then I also have one little other little thing to tie out of that, like if you, how you feel about that. But is also, do you think that the fact that I kind of feel like people are just getting away in general from more of a journalistic approach to gaming, like, you know, with the, the gamer gates and stuff like that, there's almost like this. I don't want to, I don't want to get stuff from a, produced company type of thing as much as the guy down the street that I, you know, kind of like how his opinion on things. And I want to hear him talk on something like YouTube or Twitch or whatever. Right. All right. So I'll, I'll address both of those. The first one is a basic math. The first one I actually is just when... want to hear myself talk. So you don't <laughs> <have to hear laughs> those, so. The, the first one is basic math. Uh, when you're producing as Brent knows, when you're, you, when you're working on a set and you're doing stuff and you're, you're aiming for high production values, there's production budgets involved in that. And when we shot E3 all access live from LA and you know, th- that, that, that costs bucks and you have to have sponsors <laughs> and you have to have the availability to do that. And, our model as a company, you know, back in the 2000s and even, you know, uh, whatever, uh, was the, the traditional web model, which we attract viewers, viewers watch our content, and we have advertising in front of our content, and we have sponsors, and that's the traditional type of model, right? So that's what we did, um, and then that starts to really dry up. Uh, there's the other, you know, side factor of things like ad blocker and people not, you know, trying to access the content without paying, you know, like paying quote unquote for it uh, without having to deal with with that, which meant that we weren't able to maintain budgets. And basically when it came down to it, you know, you're working in, in an environment where we're passionate about things. We're passionate about the content, but ultimately in the business world, there's two things, profitability and lack of profitability. And if, if you're not profitable and you're, you're, you're not able to sustain your budgets, then you're expendable and you're ultimately costing uh, the company money. And that's, it's just basic math. So at the end of the day, it wasn't managed to a place to, to, to uh, not on our behalf. It was just really honestly, just like kind of the ebb and flow of, of, of how things happen. So when all the management team, myself included, was let go that's what you know that was a whole different chapter so that was um and then it switched hands and it was up to the new company to decide what they wanted to do with it both creatively and monetarily and uh ultimately that was what they showed which was to shut it down and that's i guess that's the thing that i I don't quite get is i totally get maybe say scaling back your e3 production for the for the following year or following years or something like that but it just seems like getting rid of the personalities behind it like the the single thing that does differentiate you from all the other things out there that do it it would be the thing that you would be the least likely to get rid of now does that mean that you keep you're able to keep everybody on which i admittedly they did keep some people on but it just it didn't i don't know it just it didn't seem like maybe it was the best business decision even then not not even like you know looking back saying well it obviously didn't work out like i just don't even really know what they were thinking then Right, those personalities were so intertwined with the identity of game trailers that it felt like they were eviscerating the identity. Maybe, yeah, maybe they yeah. underestimated just how much. Well, that was and the I case. agree with you, Tony. And as much as I, I personally loved my work, I mean, like we're here to get some dirt, DK. That's all I'm saying is we want we want you to talk shit about. No, I'm just playing. I'm just, just what, no, what, no, I'm not. No, doing but seriously, that. talk what, shit about them. What, who got, who got saying, crabs off the toilet seat? There, come on, <laughs> come on. So I Let's agree, with your point, but I but I also disagree that the 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 um the people, myself included, that we had at GT were a huge value and asset to what we were able to create content wise. But it wasn't the differentiating factor. One of the 
major differentiating factors was our level of access that was built up over the course of time by developing trusted relationships within the industry. You can start a YouTube channel today. If you don't have an audience and you're not bringing the numbers, you're not going to get access. We had access at a very pivotal time, and that access was a huge asset that wasn't fully leveraged, um, in my opinion. But at, at the end of the day, the other here's another caveat to that whole thing is the skewing of numbers and and looking at how quote unquote video views you know versus these views versus these comments versus that and and the the reality of those numbers versus the perceived reality of those numbers and I mean there's just so much stuff flying around you know again we've addressed you've got a change in the culture of content you've got a, an utter change in the in the delivery methods of content you've got numbers on the back end that nobody knows what's happening with and everybody's just watching things explode and they don't know why or how or what or what the reality of it is. You have all this stuff happening within like a five to seven year window. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of, I mean, it really is an amazing time. But um, ultimately, this is a hugely personal story too for all the people involved. And I, I you know, I just feel um, so fortunate to have been a part of it and to have met all the people that I have and so grateful that I was able to, you know, help bring everybody here into the fray and, and, and enjoy everything that we've enjoyed. You think of all the times that we've had, honestly, we wouldn't have been doing it without Game Chiller. So I'm yeah. so thankful for it. Speaking yeah. of which, uh, Daniel, you and I have to talk about the fact that thanks to you, I ended up with Brent here. <laughs> for five plus years thanks N- nice job when i when i when i first met them all in person at the at 2009 e3 daniel pulled me aside and said i'm gonna be offloading this guy onto you so get right. ready <laughs> <laughs> later that night i woke up brent was cuddling me in the hotel room it was very our first it was very awkward so you, you seemed a lot more willing though at that point I don't, I don't know you're acting as if you were kind of pushing back but i i, I remember there you go. There you go, Tony. Blame the victim. Blame I don't the recall victim. you retracting <laughs> consent at any time. Um, actually, that's a good point, though, because you are not the only uh, guy that's been saddled with me for the past, what year is this? Eight years? Seven, seven years and change. You're not the only guy who's been saddled with me, but the, the audience has been saddled with me this whole time, too. And seeing the reactions from our audience has been really, really interesting. And uh, I, Lauren, why don't, uh, why don't we go ahead? Just, just I can't remember what the exact numbers are, but go ahead and read the results of that poll that I posted on Outlaw Gamers. Sure, Brent. I'm happy to run down the poll for this week. The question yeah. Brent posed to you guys this week was: Was Game Trailers responsible for you finding your way to EBA or OGS? And the answer shook out like this: There were two of them. <laughs> the, <laughs> the answers were overwhelmingly 96 percent, myself included. The answer was uh, yes. Ninety-six percent of our listenership came to us but, from game but trailers. But only the ninety-six. That's right. Only a the ninety-six. A scant ninety-six. Four percent came to us from other message, which actually four percent were undecided. Let's be honest. It, <laughs> it goes a long way. The other three were Bernie Sanders. Four percent uh, weren't even sure that they were there. This, right? It goes a long way to explain why we have not increased our listenership by nary one listener. Right. For four straight years and all that time, <laughs> you know. It, but that, that's the thing. It's it. You know, like when when Epic Battle Cry, and I can still recall vividly the terror when Daniel told me under the domicile of Panera Bread, I think we need to make Epic Battle Cry a video podcast. It's like what you want to do? What? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's like, "Oh no, yeah, I think I totally think we could do it." I'm like, "You have no idea what you're asking. Like, it t- like it takes all this time, and it's really complicated." And I agreed blah, with blah, Daniel. Blah. I thought you could do it. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I'm like, "Come on, man!" I'm like, "Come if on, anybody can. If anybody anybody can do it, but Brent, me can. You can." And I, and, and I remember like and I, like the bone that Daniel threw me was he's like, "Look, like we're going to shorten the episodes. They're only going to be like thirty five minutes long." <laughs> yeah, most. and I think the first episode was thirty seven minutes, and it just like it just went up by four minutes every episode thereafter. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that, you know, moving Epic Battle Cry from the audio podcast, which, I mean, we did have some listeners. Uh, we, we did attract some listeners when we were an audio podcast, notably uh, Esteban Manriquez, our longtime oh, yeah. uh, moderator and, and admin who's been, I mean, who's literally been with the site since the first, I don't know, like the first five months we were around. And um, we, we have some listeners that go back that far. But, um, but, you know, making the move to video 
which Daniel saw as being important and correctly surmised that, uh, that I could be, I could be manipulated into doing it. <laughs> and, uh, but well, my goal was to get it. I just remember Daniel having a manila folder and he just, I couldn't even see what he pulled out of it, but he was showing yeah. Brent something that he pulled out of that manila folder it, it and then put it back of, really quickly. It was a picture of carrot cake. And he says, I'll, I'll get you this <laughs> if you, if you agree to, to edit the show. No, dude, I was on the, well, th- this is how, this is how my brain works, right? Like when I want, when, when it was time to start the podcast, I was like, we're having these good conversations. And I think that we could have conversations and just record it because this podcast thing is pretty big. So let's just do it. And I'm like, but it needs to be branded. And I remember calling Ruben Escobar, James Sanchez, Filio Sweetwater, Turner Moretz. When did he and, have the James? <laughs> well, a- I don't know. His, his mom gave him the James. That's not. That sounds kind of weird, no, though. It's but- like she gave him the James. You're like, holy <laughs> shit, dude. Like, no, but- I've dreamed about a woman giving me the James, but. <laughs> Never experienced it myself. But when we do that, we were getting. Rid- I was like, I want to do a podcast. I'm like, what should I call it? And I want. I'm very resourceful, so I'm like, how about this? And I search GoDaddy. It's like, or whatever it was at the time. It's like, oh, that's not available. How about this? Blah blah. blah. I'm like, you know what? It needs to be freaking heavy metal. <laughs> and I remember calling Ruben and being like, what do you think of this name? Epic Battle Axe. And he's like, I like it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it, it was. It was one of the greatest names of all time. I, I already clicked go. Yeah, so I bought the name. So just like that happened. So I remember being on a plane, flying back and being like, you know, if we make this a video, and if I could talk Brent into doing the video, then we could put the video on game trailers and get a bigger audience. So he starts like calling around in Johnson City. He's like, listen, how much carrot cake can you produce (laughs) today? Because that's going to take a lot. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point that I was, the point that I was getting to is that making Epic Battle Cry a video podcast was what, I mean, like for us, specifically for us, not for game trailers. I don't think it really affected game trailers all that much, <laughs> but for us, like. um, that was, that was really the, the, the key that's co- that sort of unlocked everything that followed because that's where, that's where we met most of our audience. Yeah. 90, that's 90. 90- Six percent, ninety-six percent of our audience. That's how we met them. And, uh, and uh, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. Like people still talk. I mean, like people still talk about that show. I still get you know people on, you know, Twitter. There, there was a, there was a guy this week that you know I say this week. There was like a guy like two days ago that tweeted at the three of us and said, "Man, I still miss Epic Battle Cry." And you know, people talk about, "Oh, like I miss the Photoshop stuff at the beginning of the show and and the cold opens that we used to." Do. You know, we love doing our cold opens. That was something that Tony and I. We want like from the very beginning. Tony and I were like, we want to have that cold open. We want to have that, that like that conversation that you're just kind of like you know thrust into, and then something really funny happens, and and the music kicks in, and we go to the yep. like like we that really was that, we really thought through everything we did on that. I mean, like I'm not yeah. saying like things didn't some things weren't happenstance, but I mean, I'd say most of what came across in that show was something we all three of us really like you know sat well, down and really put a lot of thought into and talked about. We took all that and threw it out, and then we did. That's right. Then, I don't Prime think the listeners know left. that you guys had an entire staff, a writer's room in the back. Every joke was scripted. If only. Every single thing you guys talked about. If only about, it were true. <laughs> there was a team. You, you, you really, I mean, you have, no idea, like, how many, you have no idea like how many weeks like that cold open would be like, man, like this would be so funny if only like this had happened. And so, like, I would just like yeah. save, I would save it or something like that. And then, like, two weeks later, like, we'd be talking about it again. And then, and, 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 like, something like funny would happen out, and I would just like splice them together, you know? So, uh, and, you, Brent, we'd have like the did, first half did. of the conversation from like a month prior, and then the second half, like, where the joke finally kind of worked itself out and completed itself. Basically, it was all a sham, is what Brent's saying. Yes, like, none, exactly of it was, saying. none of it was real. I, I'll say this. It wasn't a sham, actually. It was very real. Brent did an amazing job editing it and producing it and, mm-hmm. and, and making it polished. But I, one of the things that I'm the most proud of with that podcast is the fact that when you listen, if you listen to a 32 minute podcast, our, I could pretty much guarantee our record time was less than 40 minutes. Yeah. Like, like, we were. You were listening to us hang out and talk. We yeah, were not produce like all the fluff, lean. all the stuff was. Oh, I messed that up, or our mics messed up, or whatever. But like, we were very. Oh, I mean, yeah. you listened to the raw thing. We were not produced by any means compared no, if, to. If you listen to that show, the mistake stayed in. I mean, <laughs> that, 
We what, know that. As a matter of fact, most of the show was mistakes. But. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but Lauren, uh, I want to go. I want to go to you now to to kind of you know because I know that you you've been reading the comments on Outlaw Gamers the same as me, and I, I want to go to you to kind of talk about like what GT meant to our audience and 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 the you know the people in our audience finding out the game trailers closed. I mean, it was. Uh, it, it triggered a lot of nostalgia, you know, and a lot of people were kind of talking about, and not just us, you know, plenty of other shows there, and you know, people talking oh, yeah. about all these other personalities that were that were there at game trailers, and just uh, the the thing, the the thing, Lauren, that that I, I want to specifically kind of ask you to respond to is the optimism that people saw in in game trailers content, and the fact that they said, you know, that it felt like game trailers was sort of like the last outlet that wasn't really cynical about gaming, that they still had like this really pure kind of passion for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I can speak very well of that because my relationship was largely the same. My relationship to game trailers was fundamentally different than the three of you guys because I never, on a week-in, week-out basis, was producing content for game trailers. I mean, I guest hosted on the show a couple of times when, we, uh, when Epic Battle Axe, the website, was doing... E3 coverage, you know, we were writing articles that would be end up being the news feed for GT. Yeah. But that was largely my professional relationship to game trailers uh, directly. And so my relationship to game trailers was much the same as I think all of our listeners, which was as a fan. And game trailers, um, even though I had really stopped watching game trailers um, since, uh, since the, uh, you know, the, a lot of the management and talent was let go, uh, I too felt a, a huge sense of nostalgia when I heard that Game Trailers was closing down because Game Trailers was one of my big forays back into gaming. I had I had stopped really gaming for a while there, at least on any kind of significant basis. And Game Trailers had that that infectious enthusiasm, coupled with believe it or not, Daniel, even in the early days, a sense of polish that um, I think uh, it, it was. It, I think Tony said it just so so beautifully that showed a respect for for both the medium and the journalistic side of what they were doing. And it, it, was, uh, it, it was obvious. And it really is sort of what drew me back into uh, the joy of gaming. And it's really what got me into the joy of watching people talk about gaming or watching things about gaming. Uh, and I think that's probably true for a lot of people. I mean, Daniel said earlier that, you know, game trailers kind of hit right at this really special time when, when the internet and bandwidth were coming together with uh, more high-quality you know, more content in gaming that was probably more interesting to watch visually. And those two things coupled together came just at this sort of right time where you could deliver that to people and it, it, it created a new experience and, and game trailers was at the forefront of that. And um, for, for years, uh, I mean, years and years and years, lo long after, you know, I, I joined the Epic Battle Axe family and long after you and I began doing a show and I had been writing for the website forever, I was still a fan of game trailers itself. Um, and so even though that tapered off after a while, it, it, for me, it's, it is probably my, other than our own website now, uh, and I don't just mean OGS, but also EBA, other than those two particular websites, Game Trailers is unquestionably my, my most visited gaming website uh, historically. And I think there's a lot of fans uh, that feel that way. And there's, you know, in, in our community in particular, Brent, our, our fans are very connected to us and, 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 and very connected to Daniel and very connected to Tony. And you, you remember, I mean, you guys all went through this when, when Epic Battle Cry came to an end, and it, it's, uh, it's a very powerful connection. And, and you know, we just officially ended um, uh, Outlaw Gamer Radio, although obviously we're still doing shows, and it's, it's, very, it's very important uh, to... It's as important to our listeners uh, as it is to us, I think, and they feel a strong connection to uh, Game Trailers as, as the place where that all began. That's, I, I like, something... Something that is, I, I think, is very interesting is the fact that, like, you know, we talk so much about how different, how how many different ways there are to to get content, to get these things these days, and the fact that you you know you're just talking about how you know we've <laughs> we've wrapped up EBA, you know, we've wrapped up Outlaw Gamer Radio, yet we still get together and record. We're we're like in this time where you really don't have to. You're you don't absolutely have to. Like we used to think, like, man, if we miss a week. Like that's okay if we miss a week, but we can't miss two. You know, you're yeah. gonna start. You're gonna start losing. You're gonna start this, that, and it. We're kind of at this time where I actually think that a lot of people out there really are just they tune into who they like whenever that comes up. If it's once a week, if it's once a month, if it's once whatever, 
they 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 tune into it and it's so easy now because you can create these you know you, you, you've got your subscriptions on you know whatever you know platform you're on that let you know when that so when you're that not content trying to monetize it and make a living yeah. doing it. Well, well exactly. that's a big difference yeah, yeah, I think yeah. from our perspective yeah. is, is that's true that's we, true we and I think for for Brandon and I a big part of the shift of kind of going to this more casual format is you know this realization that we're we've we're no longer trying to build an audience to monetize it to sure. make a living off of it and so we can do it just like you guys we yeah. when we feel like it yeah. you know and I think that's. But, yeah, but I agree with beauty, you. Beauty, that- that's the beauty of what this whole technological shift has enabled. Yeah. We we get that that is a it is and and not to use that phrase lightly, it is a beautiful thing that the that the four of us can get together in different parts of the country and talk and share that with people and we could be as connected as we are. And I'm so proud that game trailers helped ignite a, a revolution in the way content was consumed and bringing that let's not forget that for all of us growing up here gaming was always like behind this wall like it was always something you know you, you read in a magazine once a month and then it was even culturally kind of not very acceptable to be yeah. a gamer when we were growing up and yeah. i think what game trailers did was so like yes it was great on a technical level and it was really really cool but it most importantly for me it helped bring down that barrier to say you know what we are passionate about games games are a art form it's a medium it is interactive entertainment that is fueled by some of the most creative progressive intelligent artistic minds in the world not just in our medium but in the world and we are we love this thing and we want to share that love together in a way that's never been done before and game trailers was a part of making that a reality yeah. and for me that's the thing that i'm the most proud of that's well said that, that that's really well said and maybe maybe that's a good place to end because i i think that uh I think maybe the, the the best thing that we can say about game trailers is what Daniel just said is that game trailers helped bring gaming, not just the industry but the culture as well, to where it is right now. And where gaming is right now, DLC season passes aside, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think uh, I think we'll probably end up uh, wrapping up this episode of Outlaws to the End. And I, I mean, what can I say? I mean, Lauren, I'll kick to you for the outro, but it's just, it was really great to be on with the four of you, uh, so the three of you again, the four of us again. It was really, really awesome to, uh, to do this again and to see you guys and, and all that. We, uh, we don't do it enough, but uh, we don't do it too much either. That's true. <laughs> I love you guys. It's always good. Thank you for, for doing this because it, it, is, it is a very special time and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak about it. And uh, thank you to everyone listening who has supported Game Trailer, supported um, all, the, all these efforts of ours over the years. And uh, uh, you know, I hope people just keep creating, keep having fun, and keep loving this medium that we all enjoy. And uh, I'm, I'm, I feel the same way, and uh, thank you for giving me an excuse to hang out with Lauren, Daniel, and Brent again, because love these guys, don't get to see them nearly enough, but uh, it was uh, a lot of fun, and uh, hopefully uh, hopefully talk to you again down the road a little bit. We're, we're running out of websites to shut down in order to... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is going to be the last episode of Outlaws to the End. We'll be announcing the new show next week. Ne- <laughs> There's nothing left to close, right? I don't know. Is this- <laughs> next week is the announcement for the closure of the next week's episode. When, the, when, exactly when the right. internet closes down, we'll, we'll have a <laughs> HS tape and distribute it. That's exactly right. Well, th- Tony, Daniel, thank you guys both uh, for coming on so much. I know on behalf of the listeners, I know it means a lot to them to have you guys on the show to talk about this particular subject, uh, which is awesome. And of course, personally, I think it's awesome. So as usual, guys, we want to hear what you think about everything we talk about, uh, whether it's Daniel's hair or Tony's sultry voice. Lack of Let hair. us know what you're thinking. Uh, he's Brent Adams. I'm Lauren Baumgart. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. Hey, you got it right this time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so does this mean we're not doing the segment on uh, GP's involvement with the Jewish community? Yeah, yeah, he mentioned AARP. What are you talking about? Hey, Hey. So are you gonna cut? You gonna cut all that stuff? Daniel talked about all the you know, s- s- scandalous things that happened behind the scenes. You can cut that whole thing out. Oh yeah, yeah. We don't get sued. <laughs>